Hello everyone, I'm here today with an in-depth review of the book It Can't Happen Here by Sinclair Lewis. First of all, let's get one thing straight. This is Sinclair Lewis, not to be confused with Upton Sinclair, who was the author of The Jungle and several other books, and a contemporary of Lewis's. Apparently I'm not the first person to have been confused by this. Uh, I did at least figure this out before I started the book though. Now this is pretty unequivocally a challenging read. I didn't know what to expect from it, I kind of just snatched it up because it was free at the library and recommended to me and sounded vaguely interesting. And this book is a dystopian novel, although it differs from the slightly more sci-fi dystopian kind of novels like Brave New World or The Handmaid's Tale, in that it portrays a world very near in time to the author's world uh, and without any crazy new technological advancements that have just completely revolutionized society. Basically, this book is a political drama uh, written in 1935 while Franklin D. Roosevelt was in his first of several terms of presidency. Um, at the time, Mussolini and Hitler had already risen to power in Europe, in Italy and Germany respectively, but World War II hadn't erupted yet. This book tells the story of a United States in which a similar fascist leader, or a dictator, autocrat, whatever you want to call him, rises to power in the 1936 election. Despite everyone's insistence, including at times the insistence of the uprising fascist leader himself, that fascism just can't happen here. Now this book isn't exactly packed with a lot of feelings or sentimentality, uh, and most of the characters are defined more by their political ideologies and societal roles and that sort of identity rather than like characters in a more literary sort of novel. So this book is packed with politics from the get-go, and you'd better buckle up for tons of names, organizations, and affiliations right from the very first chapter. I'll just mention right now that uh, this is going to be a technically a mildly spoilery review, although this isn't exactly a book that can really be spoiled because you kind of know from the beginning that the dictator is going to achieve power and presumably attempt to retain it by any means necessary. What was more interesting to me though were the uh, precise political process and the state of the nation that allow this to happen in the first place despite everyone's insistence that it can't happen here. Also though, I'm not going to give away how everything ends, uh, which is why I'm saying it's only mildly spoilery. There's absolutely no way that I can cover all the details of what goes down in this book because it's complicated and elaborate. Uh, that's probably how it should be because in doing so, it avoids painting an overly simplistic portrait with merely good guys and bad guys, and it acknowledges that many alarming political movements arise in response to other alarming and perhaps equally radical movements. In the United States of this book, for example, uh, there is a communist movement that almost certainly does deserve a fair level of scrutiny and skepticism. Um, however, when this reaches the level of paranoia and fear-mongering and is used to justify the rise of fascist-like elements in opposition, it's just fuel in the fire for creating the suppressive measures that will not only be used to stifle the communists, but anyone who opposes the new regime as well. I totally agree with this, that polarization without any common ground or understanding of nuance, especially when it tends to uh, malign political enemies as the antithesis of all things good and the bringers of utter doom is bound to lead to a bad outcome, even if only because this sort of revolutionary rhetoric is likely to stir up equally cutting counter-revolutionary rhetoric and sentiments. This of course is a bit more complicated than that since sometimes a complete revolution may be necessary to get things done, but this novel does raise the question of at what point it's actually worth it. In one passage, for example, the protagonist, Doremus, reflects on this quandary and finds himself going down a rabbit hole where he even begins to wonder whether the American Revolution itself was justified, whether it was even a good thing, especially because he considers himself a pacifist most of the time. Sinclair Lewis also toys a bit here with Americans' view of their country as a place in which liberty reigns supreme and always will, in spite of the very principles of liberty disintegrating right in front of them. And in doing so, he points out a sort of hypocrisy that can arise in situations without true respect for liberty. So people will tend to fight tooth and nail for liberty and freedom right up until the point where it's someone else's liberty being violated. Uh, be it the Jew, or the black man, or the foreigner, or the seditious journalist who's criticizing the beloved president, and then it's off to jail, or perhaps even the firing squad, for the good of the country, of course. The fascist leader in this book, Buzz Windrip, and his supporters rise up straight through the existing political system and its democratic process. Buzz secures the nomination of the Democratic Party, defeating the incumbent president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, in the Democratic primary, 
by promising pretty much everything but the kitchen sink to his supporters without any real sacrifices on their part. There's a nice excerpt in the novel where the protagonist, Remus, reflects plaintively on how Buzz is for the unions but against all strikes, for the bankers but against the banks, uh, for freedom but against disloyalty. In other words, everything Buzz says is really just pandering to the majority of voters that he needs to rise to power, even though most of his promises are neither practical nor rooted in substantial policy goals, and will be forgotten as we see later in the novel. It's worth mentioning that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party as they exist in this novel are, first of all, not entirely representative of the parties at the time, since they represent a hypothetical situation moving forward from 1935 when the book was written. And second of all, even in reality, we're not quite the same parties with the same platforms that they have today. And this was also just somewhat confusing for me, and probably will be confusing for most readers at the beginning, because Sinclair Lewis refers to the parties as they were in 1935, uh, as if this is common knowledge. But for modern readers, this will make it take a little while to figure out um, just which party stands for what. Thus, for some readers, it may come as a surprise that it was the Democrats that put forward the rising dictator and not the Republican. I think this is a pretty realistic development for the time because at the time, the Republicans had fallen in popularity following the Great Depression and I think Herbert Hoover's presidency. Therefore, the Democrats were the dominant party and any rising candidate was most likely to gain power through the Democratic Party apparatus. Furthermore, the Democrats did actually at the time have a populist candidate named Huey Long who many criticized as fascist, and I think is mentioned once or twice in the novel. Um, and he was critical of Roosevelt, much like Buzz Windrip, even though they were technically from the same party. And he reasonably might have reached the presidency if not for his assassination a year before the 1936 election. The Democrats, though, were also the party of the working people, though not necessarily the non-white working people, as exemplified in Roosevelt's New Deal, which supported the working people. Buzz's promises to these working class folks, even though they were pretty much empty promises, and in some cases his actual adopting of the working class folks into his personal militia, who would be called the Minutemen, were what helped him rise to power and then helped him to maintain his power through this new army that effectively became his own sort of personal Gestapo or KGB or whatever you want to call it. In the novel, they were called the Minutemen. And it gave something to do to people who otherwise, at least in the protagonist's opinion, uh, Doremus's opinion, would have been unemployed because they lacked any talent or initiative. Indeed, the main character, Doremus Jessup, thinks of himself and pretty much is a sort of true intellectual who's interested in the political and philosophical underpinnings of society, and he loves nothing more than to shut himself up in his attic room reading a good controversial piece from anyone who offers it, regardless of their affiliation. I was wondering to what extent the author, Sinclair Lewis, thought of Doremus's views as representative of his own views. I personally could also relate to and sympathize with Doremus's intellectual and thoughtful nature, um, though as I thought about this more, I realized that this is likely true of most people reading this book, since the kind of person who will have made it past the first chapter or two has to be the type who's at least pretty interested in learning about politics because it make for pretty dry reading if not. And this means that the target audience of the book will appreciate Doremus as not just the hero of the story, but a hero in what he represents as a free thinker and a liberal in the truest nonpartisan sense of the word liberal. Through Doremus' eyes, we see and viscerally understand the horror of a world in which most of the people around him are either blissfully unaware and uninterested in the broader political state of the world around them, for example, his wife Emma, or loosely paying attention to the world, but uncritical and expressing the view shown in the title that it can't happen here, without any idea what it really is or why they think this. We see that eventually it gets to the point where a person with a college degree and a traditional liberal sort of education is regarded at best as a pretentious snoot and at worst as a communist dissident, which usually is the accusation that's pulled out when it's most convenient to the accuser. Intellectual debate and even freedom of speech and thought are no longer encouraged, and liberal arts courses at colleges are eventually replaced with more practical subjects like uh, how to fly a plane or how to throw a hand grenade. But I have to catch myself here because the reality is that the target readers of this book are not representative of the world or the nation as a whole. I, for one, am more convinced than anyone of the value of education and of free and critical thinking and learning about the world and people different than you. And you probably are too, to some extent, if you've come across this video and made it this far in. I enjoy learning. I consider myself intellectually curious. I try to challenge myself with new ideas, etc., etc. And it seems too easy for me to conclude 
if only everyone was as thoughtful about these things as I am, if only people took learning more seriously, then that would solve our problems. But this isn't by any means what everyone is like. Sure, I can blame others for being ignorant or uneducated or being sheeple or whatever your preferred pejorative term is, but not only is that kind of offensive to them, it's also placing my view of the world at the center and it's dismissive of the practical reality that not everyone in the world is going to want to or even be able to spend all their free time thinking about the principles of liberal democracies and reading books about fascist dictators rising to power in the U.S. Now, might this still become a problem in that it may allow precisely the situation Sinclair Lewis portrays in this book to arise? Maybe, but one thing that Doremus just doesn't quite seem to grasp in this book is that it's quite a privilege to be able to live the good life free of the usual first order worries like just getting a roof over one's head and food on the table and have a bunch of time to sit in his attic being all intellectual and reading the great philosophers. And maybe that's part of why this book was especially unsettling to me. Sinclair Lewis shows how easy it could be for an autocrat to rise to power, even in a situation that seems eerily similar to the present day US, but there's not such a clear takeaway about what could actually make things better. Despite Doremus's lamentations about how people don't really think anymore and they want everything handed to them on a silver platter, he seems to me to remain a true believer in the American dream, this idea that we deserve what we have and that those who don't have it need to work harder. This is especially evident in his interactions with his sort of handyman, Shad Ledoux. Doremus sees Shad as lazy and inept at his job and adopts quite a patronizing attitude towards Shad, musing to himself more than once that he would have fired Shad already, but he sees it as a sort of personal challenge to make something of Shad. Now, Shad is not at all portrayed as a sympathetic character in this novel. He's in fact one of the main antagonists and pretty much represents a lazy-ish working class guy who's lured in by the rising fascists' mostly empty promises and perhaps also by the message that at least he's still better than the blacks and the Jews. Through him, we see how an ordinary and talentless guy can rise to power as he joins the Minutemen and eventually is promoted even higher for his willingness to use violence and other tactics of suppression against political enemies, including against his former employer, Doremus. In some ways, I think Shad's story exemplifies the allure of the regime really well. And we ultimately do find ourselves rooting against him pretty heavily for the choices that he makes and for how he harms the characters that we care about. Yet I still found myself especially interested and kind of bothered by this question, what could a more effective and truly liberal system of government have done instead to help prevent someone like Shad or the millions of other Americans who joined Windrip's Minutemen from ever getting into this position in the first place where they wanted to make this decision? Yes, the dictator Buzz Windrip rose to power by making promises to the working class and probably mostly white Americans, uh, among other empty promises. But when we have a big segment of society for whom the American dream and the entire system seem to have failed them, and are sometimes rhetorically characterized as backwards and bigoted, it only seems natural that they'll vote for a leader who claims to understand them and throws them empty promises, as opposed to one who fails to understand their struggles at all. For all Doremus' noble and high-minded ideals, he still just doesn't get why his servant could possibly be so dumb and incompetent as to forget to refill the ice chest. And I have to admit, I wasn't totally sure when reading the book whether Sinclair Lewis actually intended this as a bit of a flaw in Doremus' character, or whether Lewis himself felt some level of animosity towards these so-called lazy folks who will flock to any would-be dictator who promises them power and free stuff. I'm curious what you thought, though. Do you think Lewis intended to portray Doremus's disdain for Shad and people like him uh, right from the beginning of the novel as a character flaw, or do you think it reflects how Lewis actually felt about people like Shad? Leave me a comment if you have any thoughts on this. In any case, though, I myself consider this a character flaw, and I think it shows to me that even the best of us have our blind spots. So as someone who relates to Doremus in a lot of other ways, uh, this is a good lesson to me because I want to be sure that I avoid making this one of my blind spots in my own life. You may have also noticed that all the characters I've mentioned so far have been men, so I'll say a bit more about this lest you think that this book is just a total sausage fest. While Windrip's supporters do in general tend to push for women to go back to more traditional roles rather than positions of leadership, 
um, preferring a sort of strong man in high offices. Sinclair Lewis does not seem to agree with this, as we see from several strong female characters in the novel. In particular, there is the town spinster and rabble-rouser Lorinda Pike, whom Doremus clearly admires right from the start. And Doremus's daughter, Sissy, I think it's short for Cecilia, but I'm not 100% sure on that. She plays a number of crucial roles in the novel, most notably becoming a sort of undercover intelligence agent. There was also one other minor character named Mary. Uh, I'm not going to say exactly what she does because I really don't want to spoil that part, but basically she kind of goes unhinged at the end of the book in a way that I found super admirable, and I'm, I won't say more than that. Now, upon looking into this book's background a bit more, I learned that it has risen in popularity, particularly following the 2016 election. So I guess now it's worth mentioning the elephant in the room, which is President Trump. A lot of Trump's opponents were quick to call him a fascist, particularly because of some anti-democratic things that he said and did. And if I'm going to be quite honest, some of the things that are going on right as I record this video that he's done in response to being defeated recently in the 2020 election only really add credence to these accusations. The question still always remains though, how alarmed should we be? Not alarmed at all, a bit alarmed, super alarmed, uh, panic level alarmed. Should we take Trump seriously when he openly advocates for anti-democratic changes to the structure of government? Should we really be afraid when he says that maybe term limits should be changed, at least if he were to have stayed in power? I think this is a tough question, and other than what I said already, I'm not really going to go into too much more detail about the Trump question specifically, because I think many people have done that already and are continuing to do so. What I will say, though, is that even if we do see some alarming characteristics in Trump's administration and political strategies, as I do, Trump is not the end-all be-all of fascism in any way, and to think that would be dangerous in its own right. As Madeleine Albright pointed out in a book she wrote called On Fascism, certainly we shouldn't be able to just discredit anyone by simply calling them a fascist. Some people called Obama a fascist too. In fact, he did make some sweeping executive claims that um, sort of expanded the power for the executive branch and laid a sort of precedent for some of Trump's executive orders that he did when he became president. Now, of course, at the same time, others were calling Obama a communist. Does calling him a fascist really mean that he was doing dictator-like things, or simply that people didn't like him, so they called him a name that sounded bad? That is, when is this fascist opposing criticism valid and or justified, as opposed to just being a political tool, just as potent as baselessly calling someone a communist because you want their job? Let's not overlook the fact that since this book's publication, uh, the leader, Buzz Windrip, and his ruthless regime have been compared not only to Trump, but to other leaders as well, including George Bush, and in fact, even FDR himself, a few years after the book's publication, when he harnessed his executive powers to intern Japanese Americans in concentration camps during World War II, under fears that these folks would be conspiring with the Japanese government to bring down the United States from the inside. So regardless of how we feel about Trump or whoever the current leader is as you watch this video, I think one thing we really need to remember is to focus more on what the leader or party or supporters are actually doing rather than seeing if we can put a certain label on them and have it stick. So yeah, I think one important takeaway from this book and one that some people seem to have overlooked is that a fascist leader doesn't have to come from the Republican Party. They don't have to come from where you're expecting. It doesn't have to look like Hitler or like Buzz Windrip. It doesn't have to look exactly like any particular idea you've seen before of what a fascist leader should look like. An American breed of fascism in 2020 and beyond is going to look a bit different and is going to exploit slightly different fears than the Nazis did in pre-World War II Germany. Maybe it exploits fear and hatred of Mexicans instead of Jews, which actually ironically did happen at the end of this book anyway. Maybe it promises the return of outsourced jobs and dying industries such as the coal industry instead of promising everyone a basic income of 5000 a year like Buzz Windrup's government did. Or maybe it's something entirely different that we just haven't seen yet. If we blindly assume that anyone but Trump is the non-fascist option, then we're falling into the trap of not thinking critically about what principles any democratic leader needs to uphold regardless of what party they're in. And we see presidents of any party continuing to expand executive powers to question the very validity of the whole institution of voting or to undermine or discredit any media outlets that happen to be critical of something they did, instead of engaging in fact-based discussions and debate, these are alarming things that, in my opinion, we need to keep a very close eye on. 
If you want to learn a little bit more about fascism, since it is kind of a complicated word and hard to define, I highly recommend the book by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright that's named on fascism. She talks a little bit about fascism, what it is in her opinion or what others might think it is, but also more broadly autocracy and dictatorship in the 20th century and the 21st century, leading up to some arguably fascist leaders in the very present day. And I do think that she tends to be a little bit pro-U.S., and obviously as Secretary of State under the Democratic Party, she does have a sort of slant there, although I personally didn't find it to be overpowering in any way that hugely biased her coverage of what things are going on. You might still not understand from this book exactly what the definition of a fascist really is, since it is admittedly quite complicated, but that book also kind of convinced me that, in fact, the terminology is probably actually less important than the general principles these fascist-like dictators use to gain and maintain power, ultimately through anti-democratic means, although they often use the democratic apparatus of voting to gain power in the first place through widespread support. All in all, I enjoyed this book. I was surprised and a bit alarmed to see that 85 years later, not actually a whole lot has changed, and the conditions that existed in Sinclair Lewis's day that seemed ripe for a budding dictatorship still seem eerily present today, albeit in slightly different forms. I will say I think you get the most out of it if you don't try too hard to remember every single minor character and understand and dissect every little detail, which to me seems like it would make the book take forever and probably would stress me out quite a bit because it is very complicated. Maybe that means it's worth another read for me at some point, although I'm usually kind of a one and done reader, so I probably still won't. But I will say that if I came back to it in a few years, I'd probably get quite a bit more out of it. I'm gonna be honest though, it's a tough read. You've gotta be in the mood for a full swinging, all out novel of relentless politics right from the gate. Um, so while it was good, I'm gonna need something lighter for my next read. Maybe even for my next few reads. Anyway, I hope you liked this review and let me know what you thought of it if you've read it, or if you've read anything else good by Sinclair Lewis that you'd like to recommend. Bye, and happy reading.